What's doing, everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guest on the podcast is former NHL defenseman Tom Laidlaw. Tom was drafted by the New York Rangers. He also played for the LA Kings. You can find videos of him all over YouTube here, just beating the daylights out of other NHL players. He was as tough as a defenseman as they come. He also competed on Survivor. He was on Survivor 39. He hosts a podcast of his own called True Grit Life, of which I was honored to be a guest on. Time to flip that script and have him on the show here. So go down there, smack the subscribe button, tap the like, and let's jump into it right now with Tom Laidlaw on First Class Fatherhood. Joining me now, First Class Father, Tom Laidlaw. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Great to be here. I like the title of that, being First Class Father. That means a lot to me. That's great. <laughs> well, let's start it with that. How many kids do you have? How old are they? Yeah, they're not kids anymore. I have two sons I'm very proud of. They're uh, 30 and 27. The uh, oldest one, Shane, is married uh, to a great girl. Got married a couple years ago. My younger son, Shane, uh, has a fantastic girlfriend he lives with. So very proud of them. They really... Uh, you know, you don't, as a father, I know this is the top of your show, you don't really know for sure if you're doing a good job or not, you know. So now that they got to be adults, they're independent and uh, got their own careers, really doing well. So I'm very proud of them. Good stuff. Any grandkids yet or not yet? No, no grandkids yet. Uh, I, I, that would be, like, I try to turn the clock back and keep getting younger all the time. My uh, my son and his wife, uh, they're really into the careers right now, and they're very they're really smart. Like, they really plan their lives out. And at this point, they're not interested in having kids. It doesn't mean they won't have them someday, but uh, they might be doing that for me a little bit because they know I'm, like, all my true good life stuff. So I'm not trying to get older, you know, fighting the, fighting the clock a little bit. <laughs> well, getting into the careers here, uh, Tom, if you could take a minute just to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. Yep. Uh, so I've been very fortunate in my life. I grew up in Canada on the dairy farm. Uh, my father and grandfather milking cows every day. When I got to be old enough... Uh, uh, to really get into farming, he's about 15 years old. My father, you know, grown up in the farm, so he uh, asked me if I wanted to be a farmer. At that time, my whole goal was to play in the National Hockey League, and uh, so I told him there's no way I want to be a farmer, so he sold the farm. Uh, I was very fortunate, like I said, I came to the Rangers in uh, 1980. I was drafted by the Rangers in 1978. I was at Northern Michigan University and finished that up. I uh, got here to New York, uh, had seven great years with the Rangers, played with some fantastic players, Phil Esposito, Barry Beck, Ron Greshner, Ron Duguay, the Baloney brothers, all those guys. Uh, and then I was traded to the Los Angeles Kings. And it's funny, we were, I've, I did a podcast the other day with Dave Maloney and uh, Ron Greshner. We were talking about this. When you get traded, you know, you, part of your ego uh, wants to know who you were traded for. You know, I'm a good player. And with Bobby Carpenter and, and it was Marcel Dion. Marcel Dion had been a good player, but, and I, I exaggerate a little bit, but he's like, he was like 75 years old. Like he was really this old guy. <laughs> So uh, we joke around with that, but he was, he was a fantastic player. Um, I was very fortunate in Los Angeles when I first got there. You know, the team was a good team, actually, but it was just it was Los Angeles. Nobody really cared about the team that much. And then Wayne Gretzky got traded there. So I had uh, I had another three years there with Wayne. And that was a real thrill to be playing there in Los Angeles. It became that, that you know, the Kings were the things to do, the thing to do at the time. When I got done playing, I got right into the agent business representing other players. Uh, I was very fortunate. I did that for 22 years. I had my own company. And for about five years of that, I worked for IMG. Uh, they were the largest management company in the world at that time. Um, I, I mean, I just, that business wound down. It was a good run of 22 years. And I started off, I started a company called Post Game Strategies. Um, and it really is just, it was designed to be just that. So any guys that were done playing, uh, creating opportunities for them. But what's really happened was it's kind of evolved into a place where through our, our connections, uh, people that, uh, you know, we may have a guy that plays with a golf buddy. It's a big oil guy in Calgary. And he may be looking for $100 million for an oil deal. And then we have other friends here that we know through just because we're athletes, former athletes uh, that you know have hedge funds or uh, private equity funds or family money to invest in those kinds of deals. So we put those two together. Uh, but the thing I'm really passionate about is this true grit life. Uh, several years ago, I got into, you know, like, you know, like a Jocko Wilnick, you know, or somebody that you know, gets up early in the morning and videos that and try to inspire other people to get things done. Really not knowing, we've joked around about this, you know, not knowing what we're doing as far as technology and kind of worked our way through that. So I got on Instagram and Facebook, and uh, it's really turned into a path career now um, where I'm up every morning at 3.30 in the morning uh, to the gym. I, I do a video every day, you know, going out on, a, I, I call it a march. The whole idea with the true grit life is to try to get the most out of your life and try to get better and better every day. Um, so the video is, you know, we do the video, we go to the gym, and uh, I've been so fortunate. Like you and I had, had a great event the other day there where we had some tactical training. That's where we met. Uh, Navy SEAL was nice enough to put us through. So those kinds of things that I post those videos and show people, you know, I'm 62 now, so I'm showing people, listen, don't, just because you're getting older, there's no reason to, you know, sit around and kind of, you know, mail in your chips. Uh, I was 
very fortunate. I got selected to go be on the TV show Survivor. Uh, I did that. I was 61 out there on the Survivor. So again, it's all about, you know, the, everything I'm doing is all about getting the most out of your life and try to get better every day. Um, and it's, it's been paying off. Yeah, I, I love that philosophy, Tom. Yeah, it was a great event the other day where I got a chance to meet you there. We had uh, Navy SEAL. I, I interviewed him for the podcast, invited me to come. What an experience that was. And that's part of some of the perks of doing stuff like this, getting invited to things like that. It was really, really a great event. And so, yeah, obviously you had a tremendous career here. O along this journey then, Tom, how old were you, about how old were you when you first became a dad? And how did becoming a father kind of change your perspective on life? Uh, so my uh, my oldest son is years old now, so he was 32 years old uh, when he was born. Uh, yeah, just, you know, I, I, as time's gone on, I, I don't think at the time I realized how much it had changed my life. It's one of those things I look back at now and how much of a better person it made me. Like, you know, I was, I was so fortunate, like I said, to play in the National Hockey League, but in some ways that whole sports world and celebrity world is, is not the real world. You know, it's like people are always treating you a certain way because of what you, you know, your celebrity status, I guess we'll call it. Um, and then when you have your kids, uh, you know, your priorities change. They don't care that you're a hockey player. They, they care that you're a great dad. And, uh, and I, I'm very proud. I, I got divorced from their mother. They were fairly young. They were four and six years old. Uh, and it just, it's, you know, we just didn't, I got married when I was playing hockey, not paying attention to things. And actually, sadly to say, it was one of the best things that ever happened, especially with my relationship with my boys. Cause we just, you know, I really realized that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to spend, like, it was me spending quality time with them. We did things like we had a motorhome and we would go down to Florida and Niagara Falls and Lake George and all over the place in the motorhome. And, uh, you know, then, like, you know, again, we, I, I guess at that time I didn't realize it, but I was really living the true good life. I was living all out and uh, with, with them as, as part of me. And, you know, we had a boat and we just, we really lived a great life. And my relationship with them is fantastic. Uh, they all live close together here now. Actually, we were joking around. It's kind of sad. Uh, uh, my son and his uh, wife are going down to Florida uh, for the next couple of months to work from home. Her family's down there. And it's going to be the first Thanksgiving that uh, we haven't been together. And it was kind of like I didn't realize the first time I dawned on it, it's become kind of a tradition. You know, they come to my house and eat and everything. So, so kind of sad in one way, but very proud of them, too. Yeah, very well said, Tom. And, and you mentioned there that it's nice to see as you get older to see the kind of parenting job that you did and see that your kids are successful and good family men and stuff like that. But what would you say as there, what were the top values that you hope to instill in them as they were growing up? I would say that what I see in them the most uh, is their independence. Uh, they are, you know, you hear a lot of stories about millennials and, and I don't buy that, you know, like when I think we put people in a category think everybody in that category is going to act the same way. And then they, they're totally independent men. Uh, like it, it gnaws at them. If they have to call me up and ask for help for anything, like advice or whatever, it just, you can tell it just, they don't want to do it. It's like, they want to be able to figure it out themselves. And I, I hope I instilled some of that in them, but you know, a lot of them themselves, like they really, my oldest son, Shane, uh, like in his business, uh, he actually works for a cannabis company. He's the financial head of the financial department for a cannabis company in Toronto. And he, one of his big things is that he's he's able. They come to him with situations and just assume he's just going to fix it. He's going to find out the solution to it. And that's really who he's become. Same thing, with my younger son. Uh, you know, and and two different people entirely, two different personalities, but really independent men and and really respectful. I watch them with their uh, with one with the wife and one with the girlfriend. And they just man, they just they treat them like princesses. And they're like that means a lot to me when I watch a man. Uh, treat a woman a certain way. They, I think that says a lot about the person. So there, I'm. I, that's like I watch and I go like, wow, that's like I, I'm almost like, like, am I responsible for that? Or like, you know, again, you're, you're. I think as a parent, yes, you are responsible, but it's also, you know, you're putting them in the right environment, so they're learning from other people too. You know, and I think that's, you know, I, I noticed that my son. I coach my oldest son in hockey a lot, and uh, I used to say to him all the time as a goaltender uh, that you know the crease is he's got blue paint in it. And I used to say to him all the time, get out of the blue paint because. It was, it was also a metaphor for life because if you're in the blue paint, it's like, you're, you're, it's like your comfort zone. You're staying there. But if you're really going to be effective as a goaltender, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. You know, get out of that blue crease. And it was funny. He would never listen to me. You know, he, he wouldn't get it. And then uh, it was like 30. So it's probably like two or three years ago. We were sitting around. I can't remember where it came up. And he goes, oh, now I get why he wanted me to get out of the blue crease. You know, now he had grown up and realized I was trying to teach him something about life. Uh, but he's he lives outside the blue paint now. He does his own thing. So. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, my, my oldest, I have four kids myself. My oldest is 14, just started high school. So I'm just about to hit all them areas and all that big changes yeah. that are coming and stuff. So I'm definitely uh, bracing myself for impact and all yeah. that. And yeah. one of the things, obviously, to, to play defenseman in the National Hockey League, you got to be pretty tough. Uh, what, what type of what type of disciplinarian would you say uh, you were as a dad? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? 
Well, when I grew up, uh, you know, grew up on a farm up in Canada, milking cows, and, and my parents were fantastic people. But, you know, we didn't, we we're, it wasn't like that loving, you know, I love you thing and hugging and everything. They just didn't, it just didn't, we didn't do that. It wasn't that they didn't love me and they did everything for me. I wouldn't have played in the National Hockey League or accomplished the things I did if it wasn't for them. Uh, but it was, it was discipline. Um, I remember one time when I was a little kid, uh, I was like five or six years old and back, back down to the farm, nobody locked their doors or whatever. On away, and a whole bunch of us kids broke into their house, and we stole. Uh, it's funny, we stole bacon, raw bacon, and orange juice, and we were sitting underneath the hay wagon eating. And my sister caught us, and we eating raw bacon and orange juice. She went home and told my mother. And my mother is this tiny woman, and she was not a violent woman or anything like that. But when I got home, she spanked me, man. And she she said, "When your father gets home, I'm going to tell him what you did, and if he doesn't spank you, I'm going to spank you again." So my father's a big man, like six four. I'm in my bedroom, you know, head buried in the pillow, and I hear him coming down the hallway, and I'm pretending I'm crying and I'm like that, thinking he, he won't hit me, he won't. Hit me. <laughs> and he got down, and I heard him stop at the door, and he turned around and walked back down. I heard him say to my mother, "I can't. He's crying. I can't spank him again." She marched down the hallway and spanked me again, like she said, because she was she was not going to raise a son that was going to steal things. So I learned my lesson. So there, there, I don't want to paint the picture that I was I was beaten as a child, but I was spanking, and she she took care of it. So there were. They were very uh, disciplined in terms of uh, that I was going to have a certain set of morals to live by. You know, you don't steal. You tell the truth. You treat women a certain way uh, with respect. You treat other people with respect and all that. And uh, I think that's probably what I passed on to my sons the most. I, I, I do remember as a kid, you know, the whole love thing. And it's like I really made a point of making sure I told my kids every day I loved them. And until, the, until they actually got the teenagers and, you know, it was kind of strange for them. They would go, Dad, can you just not? You know, don't say it in front of my buddies or anything like that. But they're, we're back at it again now as adults. So we make sure that every time we, t- we talk to each other, uh, we don't say goodbye until we've told each other we love each other. And I think that's really important. I think that, um, you know, because, yeah, as a, a parent, uh, you're not always going to be their buddy or their pal. Like, you've got to discipline them. You've got to tell them the things they don't want to hear. But along with that, I think it's really important that they make sure that every time, you know, they really know how much you love them. So, so I think that's the biggest stuff for me. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff, Tom. And I, I'm right there with you. I, I definitely have blown away the amount of times my parents told me that they love me when I'm with my kids. I, I definitely say it a lot more. Not again, not letting that they didn't love me. It's just it seems like it's a different a different way of living right now. And I was we were just punishing my one son yesterday. We had to take the video games away. And it's like the end of the world when you take away the technology. And It's like I felt bad doing it. And it's like I never remember my parents feeling bad for punishing yeah. me like that. If they did, they never let it off. You know, so it's definitely uh, different the way it is now. Yeah, definitely. It is true. Yeah, you can't. I mean, yeah, you, I think you're, that's a great point. You know, you want to show your son or your daughter, whatever it is, that they've done something wrong. You're correcting their behaviors for their own good. And if you're, you know, if you're crying about it or whatever, then it, they're kind of looking like, well, it's kind of confusing. Why? why is he- <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, you mentioned there before you're on, you were the first Canadian born uh, survivor player. I guess that was, if that's true there, if Wikipedia is correct. What was that experience like for you to get on? So how did you get onto the Survivor? What did your kids think about you and your performance on the show? Uh, they they loved it. Uh, they they're, they're proud of me. You know, and I, you know again, the, the it's something that's just different, right? I mean, it's like uh, like you want to live that full life. You know, like my sons, you know, parachute and all that kinds of stuff. And I, you know, they, they want to make sure they're getting everything out of life. Uh, they travel when they have time, but uh, they're they're proud of me for Survivor. It happened. Uh, is Jared Bruckheimer, uh, the producer, owns a piece of. Uh, Amazing Race Survivor and Big Brother, I think. I think that's a connection. And he's a big hockey guy. In fact, he's part owner of the Seattle Crack and the new team coming in the league. And he contacted the NHL years ago about uh, getting some former players onto uh, it was Amazing Race you wanted on. Uh, and I, we were, I had to get like a team, and, and it wasn't just me they came to, they came to a number of guys. But in my case, I had to get a former teammate that I was kind of still friendly with that was in shape and had a passport and everything. And I joke around a lot of my buddies my age now were all fat and out of shape and everything. So nobody fit the patients go on it. And then I had a buddy of mine that was working with me uh, that knew some uh, one of the uh, talent uh, agents or talent scouts uh, for Survivor, and they got in contact. And you got to go through; it's a pretty lengthy process. They, you know, you, you send in a videotape showing your personality and everything. But then they bring you out to LA for casting, uh, and then they let you know you're on the show. And uh, it was uh, it was a great experience. Like I said, the the big thing, like I I, I really live the True Grit life now. Like at, at first, I think when I started the True Grit, it was more of a business, like a nine to five thing. But now it's evolved that my life is the true grit life. It's everything I do is uh, surrounding that. And, and again, like I said earlier, part of what I try to say to people is that if you have goals and dreams, you know, go after those goals and dreams. Don't let your age or your weight or your skin color or whatever it is um, uh, stop you from doing it. So when uh, 
when, you know, it, like when you tell people now you're on Survivor, they go, wow, like, you know, like you, you're in Fiji uh, all that time and you're living out, outside, you're sleeping in the dirt, you're eating rice and coconuts. It's a real deal. I lost 12, 27 pounds when I was out there. And as well as things when I, I, I got voted off a lot, obviously I didn't win and I got voted off earlier than I wanted to. But I remember thinking when I was getting voted off, you know, like I, I did what I wanted to do. Like I played a certain way. I, I like I told all the producers and everything. I said, this is my life, true grid life. So I'm up at 3.30 every day. I make my bed perfect. My diet is nailed down. This is the way I live my life. I mean, I'm living life all out. I have fun too, but it's all about discipline. It's not, you know, a lot of people crying on the show and everything. I said, listen, you won't get me crying. I'm not going to ever cry. I'm not <laughs> quit, all that kind of stuff. So when I played the game, I played that way. And when I got voted off, I remember sitting at, uh, we were tribal council. And it kind of looked like that guy was one of the people that was going to get voted off. And I remember saying to myself, you know what? I, I don't want to get voted on, but I'm I'm happy with the way I played. And to me, that's a big thing. Like you, when you're doing what you're doing, you got to be looking in the mirror and saying, "Yeah, I'm doing it the way I want to do it." Like I I go to the gym all the time. I say to people, "Listen, it's important to look in the mirror. I don't stand there and stare at yourself, but take a look because you're working hard for a goal. You, you want to look good. You want to feel good. And it's important to look at yourself once in a while. And say, okay, yeah, I'm on the right track. Um, and Survivor was part of that for me. Yeah, the reality TV series is have just blown up, and I've had Boston Rob on here from Survivor, a very popular player. But I think he played, spent more time on the island than anybody. But uh, I've had these other reality guys from The Bachelor, Bachelorette. It's fun to talk to them and see what these experiences are like, kind of behind the camera, because it's really uh, some of the most uh, popular TV that we have right now. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Um, I would imagine the experience has to be the same. Now, what about your podcast here, Tom? What was the genesis of It's In the Box, and uh, where can my listeners find it? Yeah, so I, I do a show. I do several uh, podcasts. Uh, I, Kevin Allen, who used to be the hockey writer with USA Today, we do one every Monday and Wednesday morning at 1030. We go on uh, uh, Facebook Live, uh, and then it's on my YouTube channel as well, so it stays on my profile page on Facebook. Uh, and then I do actually do another one on Thursday mornings with uh, Elaine that was on Survivor with me. She's very funny. Um, she's, uh, she lives a, she's a farm girl up in Kentucky. Uh, she gets on, we have a laugh, we poke fun at each other and uh, have a few laughs. And then I have the, the show that probably has the most viewers is on Thursday. Uh, again, it's all on Facebook Live uh, with former teammates Ron Greshner and Dave Maloney. And it's funny, like early in the pandemic, we were sitting around, we were bored. So I contacted, uh, there was also Ron Duguay to start with. I contacted us, guys, let's jump on uh, Facebook Live and have some fun. So we we didn't know where it was going. We just told some old stories and you know, Rod Duguay was funny. He was in his bedroom and he had, he was a big playboy back in the day. So he had this, you know, nice blonde walking through the back and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and the fans, the Ranger fans loved it. And uh, we just, we just continued it. And uh, it's got a pretty good following now. And uh, it's just, we just have fun. We ad lib, but we don't really know what we're going to talk about necessarily. It's hockey talk. And one goes in another. So it's been fun. And, and those things have really led to others for me. I met you, you know, you're going to come on my show. Um, you know, I have a lot of Navy SEALs, other uh, military personnel, but people are like now when people are wanting to promote like events or whatever, they'll come on my show. And it's always like, you know, I know, you know, this, you've done a fantastic job of yours. We were talking about the other day. Um, it just one leads to another, right? I mean, it just, you just meet people and through that you meet somebody else. I and mean, that's how we met at the event the other day. So, um, been a lot of fun. I didn't really anticipate that that was going to be a big part of what I was doing. We've got a book coming out. Uh, again, it's true grit life. Hopefully it'll be done in the next month or so. Uh, but the podcast has been a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome stuff. And, and before I hit the last question, I'm going to put the links to all that uh, your social media in the description of podcast episodes so my listeners get over there and uh, see it. Uh, right. Hockey, tough game to get into, like all professional sports. Uh, one of the things I usually ask the NFL players that I have on is about all the concussion stuff that's happened. It's kind of changed the way that uh, kids go about getting into football. Uh, I don't know if it's the same with hockey, but what would you say is a safe age for kids to start getting out there and uh, putting on and actually full blown hitting hitting one another and ha what's the best way for them if they have that passion to make it all the way to the pros? What route should they take? Well, the USA Hockey uh, is the governing body for youth sport for youth hockey, and they don't allow hitting. I think until 12 years old now. Uh, with some, you know some old hockey people, you know, kind of think, oh, that's no good because they don't learn it to them. But uh, as far as the head injuries, it's a great thing. So kids can start at a young age. It's like, you know, I think a lot of parents, they see the fighting and the violence and all that. That's not the youth game at all, especially now. It may have been many years ago when I played, but now it's very safe for the kids. The equipment they have is fantastic, face shields and masks and everything. And again, they cannot hit. And again, I think I'm right at 12 years old. So they get to learn the game, get to really feel comfortable out there on the ice, and then the hitting starts. But again, it you know, they, again, the referees and everything, it's, we have hitting, it's more, you know, tactical hitting. It's not hitting to hurt somebody. It's hitting to just, you know, play the game the right way. So for me, when, you know, you can start kids, you know, three, four or five years old, you know, if they've got a passion for playing, 
And, and to me, that's one of the big things with parents. I, I coach a lot of youth hockey uh, and, and, and parents are fantastic. They love their kids. You know, 99 times out of 100, their intentions are just the right things for the kids. The problem sometimes is the parents get a little uh, too involved in the sport and, and want to like push their son or daughter to get them to be better. And, and you get it. They, they, they love them. They want to see them do well. They, the same way they push them in school to do better in the school. But with sports, there's, there's passion involved, right? And it's got to be the, the, the player that has the passion for the game, not the parent. So my best piece of advice for a parent is, listen, spend tons of money and tons of time driving around in a car uh, to buy, you know, to get your kids to the game and practice. But once you get there, it's kind of like, you, okay, now you got to disconnect and say, listen, son, I'll cheer you on. Uh, or daughter, I, I love you to death. Good luck. Have fun. But it's got to be them that goes out and plays with the passion and practices with passion, too. Yeah, great, great stuff, Tom. And the last thing I'm going to hit you with here, I'd love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what kind of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? You know, I think the biggest piece of advice is it goes quick. I mean, my, my kids are 30 years old and 27, and I think to myself sometimes, wow, like where did the time all go? So when you're, you know, when you have opportunities to do things with your kids, uh, you know, you'll take advantage of opportunities, whether it's like things like camping and everything, you know, it doesn't always have to be going to a fancy hotel or whatever. Like when we went and had our motorhome and we went out with my sons, man, it was some of the best memory. They still talk about how great it was. Uh, so, you know, those like really spend quality time with your kids, like be engaged with your kids, put the cell phone down, you know, watch their game. You know, because the kid's looking up in the stand and he sees his father or mother on the cell phone. You know, it doesn't do it. Like they want to know that you're engaged in what they're doing. And and again, you got to love them to death. Uh, but again, you are their parent. You're not their friend. So you've got to, you know, you're the one that's got to provide the discipline. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. It's been an honor for me. I got to say, Tom Laidlaw, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. But thanks for being on my own. You're the best. I'm very proud of you. You built something real special here. And I'm going to have you on our show next week.